A thousand and more years ago, the word ahoy, yelled in fierce chorus by the crew of a high, proud galley, was heard with dread. It was the war cry of the invincible Vikings. In this complex world, where word meanings are constantly changing, it's easy to be misunderstood. That's why it's a good idea to know your words. And now, back to our story with Hope Winslow. Yes, Serena Landon was clouding up. But it wasn't because she knew how it was when you loved somebody and lost them. Looking back across a life which was painless, peaceful, and passionless, she could think of nobody she really loved and lost. Living alone with a maid and a cat. The typical spinster. She overpaid the little seamstress and sent her on her way rejoicing. And then she sat alone, thinking. Thinking, thinking. And suddenly she was a Scotch little girl standing behind a portier. Her father and mother were in the middle of the room facing each other angrily. I'm divorcing you, Alfred. I'm glad. There is only this. I want to see Serena as much as possible after the final decree. You want to see Serena? You want to see her? I'm divorcing you, Alfred. Don't forget that. You'll never see Serena again, not if I can help it. As long as you live, Serena will be completely my child from now on. And if that happens and she falls and skins her knee and cries, there'll be little icicles sliding down her cheeks. Poor Serena. Poor lost youngster. As time went on, Serena heard bits of gossip about her father from below stairs. Cook had seen him on the street with his new wife. Laughing, she was. All the time, laughing. And her lips red as red. Later, Serena heard that the laughing woman with the red lips had been seen pushing a baby buggy. Must be a girl, Cook had said. The carriage cover was pink. Years later, Serena read an item in the paper. Her father was dead. The item called him a widower. Serena said aloud, and it was the first time she'd ever said it, Somewhere, I have a half sister. I haven't loved her and lost her, because I haven't known her. But somewhere she exists. She reached for the telephone and dialed a number. Okay, Calendar speaking. Oh, Mr. Calendar. Uh, this is Serena Landon. Miss Landon, it's nice to hear from you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Mr. Calendar. I'm, uh... I'm coming to you with a strange request. Yes? Uh, could you recommend a discreet firm of private detectives? Well, now, this is a surprise. I wish to locate a woman. Uh, her name? Well, she hasn't married. Her name is Landon. And she must be about 12 years younger than I. Uh, maybe you should handle the detectives for me, Mr. Calendar. I haven't had very many dealings with detectives, and I, I might find myself at a loss. I'll write out the few small clues I possess and send them to your office. I'll do that. And in the meanwhile, uh, that will of mine, she'll be one of the beneficiaries. I see. Uh, a missing relative? Yes. Well, I'll do what I can. Angels could do no more. Thank you so much, Mr. Calendar. Well, I'll say goodbye now, and I'll send you those clues by special messenger. But I must again warn you that they're very inadequate. And Serena dropped the receiver into its cradle. Seated at her desk, she tapped nervously on its brown satinwood surface with thin parchment fingers. And suddenly, a little panel in the back of the desk clicked open. She saw an envelope. No, there were two envelopes. They were held together with a bit of faded ribbon. 
He almost forgotten about the envelope. He put them there so long ago. Almost 50 years ago. She untied the ribbon. She opened the envelope which bore the earliest date. And read the letter aloud. I'm asking you to marry me, darling. I know what it would be like asking a lily to transplant itself to a swamp. The slums are very like a swamp. They have quicksands and ugly undercurrents. I haven't the right to raise my eyes to you. I'm only a settlement house superintendent. But I love my work. And perhaps I can make you love it. Serena slid the letter into its envelope. The creases had almost worn through. The writing was faded, but it still had authority. She opened the second letter, and once again she read aloud. This time her voice was low, almost a whisper. So you've rejected my proposal of marriage, Serena. Even though I think in your heart you love me. For you've admitted that you'll marry me if I'll give up the settlement house and take a job with the city trust company. But, darling, you know what my decision must be. The mission is in the center of a very bad neighborhood. Many of the young men are drifting in the wrong direction. Some will end up in prison. But perhaps I can keep a few of them from looking out at the world through barred windows. I'm sorry, dear, that we, too, must travel in opposite directions. I think we might have been very happy. Serena slipped the second letter into its envelope. She tied the faded ribbon, returned both letters to the secret panel, and pushed it shut. Gently, soundly. Why, she had loved and lost somebody after all. Not in the way Mrs. Wilkins, the seamstress, had meant, but... In a mission far downtown, a saintly man with white hair still worked tirelessly. She'd leave money to the mission in her will. No, she wouldn't do this. She'd give an immediate donation. She looked up a number in the directory. Once again, she reached for the phone. Gateway Mission? Uh, may I speak with Mr. Ellery Blake, please? I didn't know. Yes, I understand how you all must feel. I wanted him to come up here. I wanted to give him a check for his work. Well, I'll send the check anyway, in his name. Yes, it may help his assistant to carry on the work. It's called a week ago, I'd have seen. I'd have seen it again if I decided to make my way with you, girlie. Just one short week. A lonely woman sitting by her desk. Muffing, the cat came by and rubbed against her leg. She stroked the silken fur absently. The cat made a little chirp and jumped onto her lap, and she sat there, stroking it. She was remembering the woman who had stood beside her while she stroked the same cat, then a kitten. It's my sister's girl. Uh, my sister that's been dead these many years, ma'am. Uh, sure, my niece was going around with a boy... And then there was Mary. Yes, yes, go on. And now he's gone, ma'am. He just disappeared. And there's a baby coming. And she finds that they wasn't legally married, that he had another wife somewhere. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, that's a great pity. I'm sorry that your niece was tricked. I suppose you want money for her? All right, I'll give you a check. It's more than a check I want, ma'am. 
More than a shack. Well, uh, we have a big house here. If I could have the girl with me, so young she is, and, and no one else. An expecting mother, no, Cora. Well, that would upset me terribly. I hope this request of yours won't spoil the very pleasant servant-mistress relationship between us, Cora. No, ma'am, it won't. I'm sorry I brought it up. So am I, Cora. But we'll forget it from now on. Shall we? In just a moment, Hope Winslow will be back. The traditions of the country are part of each citizen's culture and something he can be proud of. Take, for instance, the traditions of the United States Navy. Did you ever wonder how the sailor got that broad collar? Well, listen to this. Around about 1780, it was the vogue for seamen to wear their hair in a long, heavily greased pigtail. A neckerchief was worn to keep the grease off the jacket. In time, the neckerchief was replaced by the extra-long collar. But when seamen stopped wearing greased pigtails, the long collar remained as part of the uniform. And it's a distinctive uniform that every seaman can be proud of because it is a part of the great traditions of the United States of America. And now, back to our story with Hope Winslow. Serena Landon's hand slipped away from the silken fur of her cat, and the cat gave a disgusted little sound, jumped off her lap, and trotted out of the room. Reaching over, Serena pulled the needlepoint bell cord. There was a far-off tinkle, and almost immediately a door opened. Yes, Miss Serena? You rang? I rang. Cora, do you remember a time three years ago when you came to me with a strange request? Yes. I remember. I've changed my mind about your niece. Oh, but Miss Serena... You may ask her to live in this house. It is a large house, and you have plenty of room in your apartment. The baby would be about two and a half now. Of course, you're going to have to keep him quiet. The little Jimmy is two and a half, Mama. We're not far from the park. His mother can take him to the park every day. My niece died, Miss Serena, and the baby was born. They said it was worry and heartbreak all mixed together. Oh? The child. I board him out, ma'am. I go to see him every Thursday afternoon and every Sunday afternoon that I'm free. Miss Serena? Are you feeling all right, Miss Serena? I'm feeling perfectly all right. That woman who hemmed the towels. I want to get in touch with her immediately. Oh, did she do something wrong? Something wrong? Certainly not. She set me on the right path, Cora, by reminding me that I'd lost a great deal. I'm going to put her on a salary. I'm going to find dozens of things for her to throw. Oh, she'll be that relief, ma'am. <laughs> going along, doing piecework day by day. She never knows what will come next. Well, she'll know from now on. You don't have to wait until Thursday this week, Cora. You may go this afternoon. What? Well, go where, Miss Serena? To pick up the child. A child in this house might be like a fire. At which a lonely, selfish woman could warm her hands. And her heart. <laughs> Serena Landon sent a wreath to an old man's funeral. She sent a huge check to a mission in the slums. She made an arrangement that was in the nature of a trust fund for a sewing woman. She talked long distance with a half-sister whom she'd never acknowledged before. She stood beside a sleeping child's crib and looked down at him. The maid who had been with her a long while, stood beside her. Isn't he a handsome child, Miss Serena? His lashes are like butterfly wings against his cheeks. 
He has a stubborn little boy chin. But his hands with their dimples are still baby hands. He'll go to a good school. To college. <laughs> now don't cry, Cory. You'll have me crying too. <laughs> Slowly, Serena went back to her lovely room with its polished desk. As she entered the room, the phone was ringing. She lifted the receiver from its cradle. Hello? This is McKay Callender. Oh, Mr. Callender. Uh, you're calling me about the will? That's right. Look, Miss Landon, I don't know what's happened to you, but I'm a bit worried. You're, you're doing such strange things. Money's running through your fingers like water. Are you feeling well, Miss Landon? There's nothing in the least wrong with me, either physically or mentally. I think I'd better come to your house and have a talk with you. Uh, will this afternoon be convenient? Why, come to dinner if you'd care to. But um, I've some shopping to do early in the afternoon. I must buy a few unhemmed tablecloths, and uh, between five and six, I look at picture books with little Jimmy. This is too much, Miss Landon. If you go on the way you're going, you won't need to make a will. You'll have nothing to leave. You're absolutely right, Mr. Callender. Dinner will be at seven, Mr. Callender, and I'll enjoy having a guest. <laughs> I wish I could have seen the gay calendar's face while we were talking. <laughs> it must have been a study. <laughs> Suddenly soft hearts, almost invariably accused of being feeble-minded. <laughs> the world in which we live is a funny one, but essentially nice. When Serena Landon phoned a settlement house, she learned that the man she'd loved and lost at the age of 25, not through death, through life, had been called to his reward. And that an assistant, one Martin Price, had taken his place. And now, here's Hope Winslow to tell you more about the Settlement House and Martin Price. Sometimes, no, no, I'll admit that almost always, the superintendent of a settlement house guides the destinies of a whole neighborhood. But when you meet Martin Price, he'll be guiding the destinies of a woman who came from across the sea and met with disillusionment and failure. Until then, this is Hope Winslow saying goodbye from the Whispering Street. Today's program was written by Margaret E. Sankster. Featured in the cast were Peggy Weber, Paul Dubois, Helen Klebe, and Virginia Gregg. Whispering Street was directed by Gordon T. Hughes and produced by Ted Lloyd. Your announcer is Dan Coverley. Whispering Street has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.